All right, well, let's get started. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Really appreciate you um, getting on this call at six o'clock tonight. I think we have a really good panel put together. We thought, you know, uh, Chef Patty and I got together and you know, talked a little bit about what we thought would be important to show students. And, you know, she helped me immensely with getting this panel together and we um, are happy to share these experiences with all of you. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Chef Autumn Patty. She is the program director, assistant professor at HACC, and she um, is involved with their culinary arts and their baking and pastry arts program. And she's the president of the ACF Harrisburg chapter. So she's got a lot on her plate, but we appreciate her taking time today to moderate and to um, take us through this program. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Hope. And, and again, welcome to you all. Uh, I do want to give some extra um, encouragement and support with Rashida Carter, who is our um, student representative on the board for the ACF Harrisburg chapter. She really had a hand in today of formatting the questions and really looking from the student's perspective, because that's what this is for, for you as students to ask your questions, to hear responses to questions that you have uh, for something you can get into, into this industry. And that's really what this, the focus is of today. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And I thank all of our panelists again uh, for joining us. I'm gonna start with going around and having you introduce yourself and let us know what your position is, what your title is, and a little bit about what your job is for those that may not be familiar with it. Let's go ahead and start with Chef Casey Callahan. Welcome. Hi, how are you tonight? Um, I'm Casey Callahan. I am the co-founder of Raising the Bar. It's a small scratch bakery located in the historic Broad Street Market in Midtown Harrisburg. Um, thank you, Chef. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to Chef Rob Billet. Thank you for joining us. Hi, uh, uh, Rob Billet. I am the owner of Shredders. Um, just recently opened a brick and mortar location, mostly for carry out. We opened April 9th. Prior to that, I had a food truck on the road part time. I have, and prior to that, I was in charge of menu development for Hassel's Steak and Seahouse for 32 years. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have Chef Anna Smith. Welcome. Hello, uh, I'm Anna Smith. I am a line cook at uh, Cafe 100, which is located in Messiah Lifeway, which is a retirement com community. Great, thank you for joining us. And then we have Shana Schultz. Thank you for joining us as well. Hi, I'm Shana. I'm a registered dietitian um, with Giant. I'm at the Giant in Camp Hill. And at that location, we have a cooking school. And so I manage the cooking school there. Well, thank you all again for, for joining us and for everyone tuning in, please feel free to use the chat function to ask your questions as we go through. If it does pertain to the, you know, the topic at the moment, I will interject. Otherwise we will have a Q and A session at the end. So please feel free to start adding your questions into the chat as we go along. All right, our first question uh, that the students formatted is really what does your typical day or week like? And I say your week like because I know for you, Chef Casey, and we'll go ahead and start with you again. I know you're not necessarily Monday through Sunday. There are certain days that are heavier. Could you tell us a little bit about what your week is like in your position? Sure. Um, we are open at the market only on Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays. Um, that being said, the market is open for 35 hours. Um, it's myself, my partner, Tamisha, and we have one worker. Um, we will be open five years this um, July. It'll be a five year anniversary. Those first two years, it was just Misha and I, we did not have a worker. So um, while a lot of people have said to us in the past, oh, it must be nice having a part-time job, um, just because we're there those three days, those are three days where we're physically working and waiting on customers. Um, we have Wednesday, which is our prep day. Um, usually Tuesday is our shopping day. Um, because we're not big enough to be able to bring Cisco in or have things delivered to us. We actually have to go to the restaurant depot, supplement at other places um, like Giant, stuff like that. So pretty much that leaves us with Sunday, Monday with rest days. I will say since the pandemic kind of threw us, you know, everybody for a loop, we did things that we, again, like everyone else, we didn't normally have to do. So we immediately, because we were closed down, we immediately went to take to um, delivery service and then we really had to start producing menus. Um, my partner, Tamisha, she kind of spearheaded all that and took that all on. So while we have, I mean, Sunday's definitely my day off. 
I don't do anything on Sunday. I'm like, who's texting me? But Monday, <laughs> while it might be our day off, we still have, we, while we have an accountant, the accountant doesn't pay our bills. We have to still pay our bills, um, figure out what our menus are going to be, stuff like that. So Monday's kind of a stay at home, a little bit lazy day, answer some emails if we have to. But other than that, the rest of the week is cleaning and getting ready for those, those three days that were open. Great, thank you. Yeah. Tina, how about for you? I think every day is probably different, but what, what does your general week look like for you and your responsibilities? I'm sorry, you said Shana, right? Okay, I couldn't hear if it was Shana or Tina, I apologize. Um, so my world is kind of different now, of course, with COVID as well. Prior to COVID, as I mentioned, um, the Camp Hill Giant has a cooking school. Um, so a, a pretty large area um, where I used to run cooking classes a couple times a week that were open to the public, um, customers um, that were either just passing through or would register ahead of time. So um, now in the, the virtual world, we're doing all of those classes online. So I do several classes online um, throughout the week, Monday through Saturday, um, during the day and in the evening. Um, a lot of them are cooking demo based where uh, we encourage customers to make meals along with us. So for example, Tuesday evenings, we do family meals at five and we give everybody the ingredient list ahead of time in the hopes that they are just cooking right along with us and have dinner on the table for their family um, by 5.30 when we're done with class. So we do anything from those healthy type cooking classes because like I said, I am a dietitian. Um, but then we also do some fun baking ones, um, both for adults and kids. Um, and then we also do a lot of classes that are more disease specific. So like cooking for diabetes or heart health recipes and, and things of that nature. So that's primarily what we're doing right now. So do you develop and conceptualize each cooking class or is there some sort of format that comes down to you? No, nope. So it's all up to our discretion. Um, we're now up to a team of eight dietitians. Um, so we've really expanded. So we're everywhere from Central PA, Lancaster, Philly, as well as Maryland um, areas right now. And um, with being virtual, we've actually been able to um, capture a much larger audience than when we were in stores. So right now we have people attending our classes from Texas, from Canada, um, from all over. We've really gotten a large group of people, but Giant has been really great to allow us to design these classes how we want them to be, come up with our own recipes. Um, we have a lot of aut autonomy in that way. So it's been a, really fun to, to be creative and customers give us a lot of input. We always ask for feedback. So we always try to, to do what they wanna learn about in the kitchen as well. Hey, and so that sounds like so many different moving parts. Is this a Monday through Friday gig for you or is each week completely different? Um, it's really different. Um, so like I said, I'm doing classes Tuesday night, Saturday morning, Thursday nights, and then like Friday mornings, it's all over the place. Um, and that's how it was whenever I was in store too. It, it was never really a Monday, Friday type thing. Um, Which is great to know. Again, this, this student audience here I think may have that that visual that you know that's a Monday through Friday yet I think your position is a little bit more unique a little bit more exciting forgive me but you know in the new yeah. world I think you know that's good to hear that there's some spontaneity and you know it's not the same every day. Awesome. Yeah dietitians professions can be really different you know um, I think a giant being a retail dietitian especially um, is much different than a dietitian before I came to Giant being in the hospital or being in a school district or, or something of that nature. So there's a lot of different ways that you can go in the nutrition field, but I will say that the way that I'm at now is definitely my favorite. Well, thank you very much. Anna, let's move on to the a line cook position. You know, I, I've been talking with you the last couple of weeks. I know you've been working maximum hours. Um, what is what is the world like for a line cook? Uh, well, I mean, my position as a line cook is a little different than others because we are not opened as late. Um, our restaurant is open from se um, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. So we're not working as late hours, but uh, it is an open kitchen 
and uh, it is a mostly from scratch kitchen also. So it is a lot of prep and a lot of uh, cooking and interacting with the guests uh, daily. And we also have events that we do um, like two times a month at least uh, that is interactive. Now it is, it used to be because of COVID it was takeout, but now we're starting to do interaction. We are doing a hibachi grill in a couple weeks and things like that. So like, it's uh, it's very interactive from my standpoint and uh, busy. So you're at an assisted living facility, but you work for a contract management company, correct? Yes, I work for Cura. And Cura I mostly do in assisted living facilities all over the country. Okay, so explain to those that may not be familiar with what a contract management company is. Um, the contract uh, management company is a company that manages kinds of um, restaurants in other locations. So the location, which is for us is uh, Messiah Lifeway, doesn't have to manage it themselves. They don't have to hire or um, con or how is this? They don't have to hire or um, manage any of it. They can just pay another company to do it for them. Okay, right, great. Well, and that's what they did. So they contracted out, and, and that's what company is in there at Life or Messiah Lifeway. Yes. Just curious, what, um, are, are there any specialty diets or things that you need to be concentrated on knowing that it's an assisted living facility, um, knowing your clientele and having the less hours? Is there any more um, dealings with, with specialty diets that you have versus other? Not as much as you would think. Uh, there's another another building, we call it like the, the medical building or whatever that ha takes care of the, the much more sick patients, the ones that uh, have had surgery or the ones that are, are you know, having dementia or um, it's, a full, um, it's a full cycle of facility, like, uh, when you when a resident comes, they first will live in a cottage or in an apartment. Uh, they are fully functioning. They just most of them have just retired. Some are still working, um, and they'll live in those uh, apartments or cottages until they get sick or have any issues, and then they will move into uh, the main building we call it that has nurses and doctors and uh, around the top around the clock care and there is where you get more of the specialty diets um okay great so about how many hours are you working a week um right now we're a little short staff so right now it's about um 45 to 50 hours average Sometimes Monday, more. This week I worked 60 hours. This week I've worked about 45. Is that Monday through Sunday, day, evening? Um, I mostly work evenings, usually 1030 to 8. Um, sometimes I'll open, which is from 7 a.m. to till 3. Um, it just varies on the, the week. Um, they try to give you every other weekend off. Right now, I'm not doing that more because there's only three of us in our kitchen. So um, to, to avoid people working doubles on the weekends, I'm working every weekend. So the other two people can work every other weekend. Um, so I get two days off during the week. And so I'm hearing very sporadic shifts. And again, it could be day, morning, early morning, evening. Yeah. And you've mentioned that you're closing earlier than most operations. So in the past, you've worked a lot later, I'm sure then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I worked at the Hilton before this and um, line cooks there. We get off at like 12 to 1, depending. And they close at 11. And a lot of other restaurants don't close until later than that. So okay. just one cook is very feel to the life. Yeah. Thank you. You gotta love it. Yes. All right. Well, let's shift gears then. Rob, can you share with us a little bit about your weekly, um, you know, tasks in the world? I know 
Now we introduced the concept about, you know, the food truck and you talked about your brick and mortar now. So what does your general week look like? Um, it, my hours vary based on whether we have a food truck out or not, but typically I'll start at seven or eight in the morning at the brick and mortar location. We do all of our uh, preparation there for the food truck. So then the food truck could be out from five to nine or from five to seven in a neighborhood or uh, 4th of July fireworks. We don't get done till we don't get back to till close to midnight. So it's kind of all over the place. Uh, we try not to book anything on Sundays unless it's something really big and we close the brick and mortar location on Sundays. Um, right now, I'm only taking off one day a week just because we just opened the brick and mortar and we're still trying to get a few people hired so we can extend some hours at the brick and mortar location. And we just started running. the Today was the first day we took the truck out for the season. So uh, that was a lunch service. But uh, like this weekend, we're out on Saturday from 12 to 5, and next Friday we have a catering job from 4 to 6 for 120 people, and then we follow that up on Saturday with a 12 to 5 food truck event and still trying to run the brick-and-mortar location. So it's kind of all over the place. Certainly sounds like it, and, and I think this is a good intro into it. Why <laughs> did you choose, into our next question, why did you choose this? This career, why did you, and I know you have a unique story, why did you open a food truck? Why then did you get your brick and mortar? Students are curious, you know, why did you choose this path for yourself? I, uh, I started at McDonald's when I was 15 years old. Um, so I started, I actually worked in a bar cutting grass and cleaning up in the mornings when I was 14. I went to McDonald's when I was 15. They introduced me into their management program. I ran a, I was a general manager for 10 years. Um, I worked for a franchisee, so there wasn't any opportunity to really move forward. They had three district managers. And so I started looking for something else to do. I ended up at Haas's. I was a general, I was hired as an assistant manager, became a general manager after eight months, ran restaurants for a couple of years. I was a district manager for, I don't know how many years. And then I was in charge of food development for the last five, just based on anytime we had a promotion or something going on, I was always the one coming up with stuff. So eventually they just said, hey, why don't you just do all of our menu development? So I developed products for the salad bar and every aspect of, of the company. I worked out of Hummelstown. I had an office in Hummelstown and that was my test kitchen. So moving forward, I, I opened up a food truck with a, with a partner on the side just for something to do, just because we were always, I, I love diners, drive-ins and dives and I love food trucks. So we decided to open one and we ran it about once a week uh, during the season. We probably do anywhere between 30 and 40 events a year. Then COVID hit and you know what happened to the restaurant industry and Haas had to close some restaurants and I knew I'd be one of the first ones to go because there was no menu development. There was nothing going on, you know, and they needed to cut some, cut some uh, weight off the top. So um that happened to me and they were good to me for 32 years. I have nothing but good things to say about them. They had to do what they had to do. Um, I had the food truck, so I could have found another job or I could have stayed on unemployment. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to take this risk and open up a brick and mortar location, try and do more food truck events. And that's kind of where I'm at now, hoping to open another location here in September. Um, at the Hershey, they're opening a really big farmer's market in downtown Hershey. Uh, so I'm hoping to, they called me and asked if I wanted to be in. So I'm hoping to get into that location as well. And then we'll go from there, but I have to find some more people. <laughs> so I, I may have, forgive me if I missed it, but um, what, what got you initially interested in the industry all around? I know you started at McDonald's, but what, what drew you to this industry? Um, well, my brother was a manager at McDonald's, so I knew it would be an easy job to get. So I got that job and I just really liked it. Ended up in their management program. And then when I got with Haas's, I've always loved cooking. I mean, I've been a, I've been a at home cook. I probably cook 95% of the meals at home. I always have. My dad did. So I've always been drawn to food. And then you know, it's just one of those 
passions that you either love it or you don't. You know, not everybody is cut out for the restaurant business, but if most people who are and are in it really love it. I agree, absolutely. It's great advice for students, making sure that you are passionate about what you're doing. Excellent. <laughs> Casey, let's, let's, my same question to you, and let me repeat it is, you know, why did you choose this career? What got you interested and started in it, specifically where you're at now? What, what got, what, what interests you and got you started in the career? Um, I didn't go to culinary school, so I was 23. I, you know, I had the whole regular college route. Um, and I pretty much always worked um, in a corporate environment, first for the Philadelphia Marriott, and then I moved back home to Harrisburg. Um, and started working for the Hilton and then opened Brico and Chow. And then of course, worked with Chef Patty at Hack as well. And um, I'd been with Brico for almost 16 years and well, the Hilton for 16 years. And I can't really say what it was. I just think a lot of times you just feel like you start treading water at some point and I had to do something and I didn't know what. And I started chit chat with one of my workers <laughs> and um, sooner rather than later, um, we kind of like took the little plunge. Um, I always actually say it was Tamisha because I really was like, I have kids. I don't know if I can afford this. And Tamisha took me for a walk at the Broad Street Market and like bought me coffee. And I was like, oh, this seems amazing. And we did it. We really did jump right into it. Um, I don't know if it was the brightest thing to do, but um, we just, I don't know. We, we just kind of went for it, but we felt confident because well, we both had a very like long history. Like, you know, she had over 10 years. I had, oh my gosh, 16, 18 years. Um, so we knew the food wouldn't be the issue. We knew we were gonna provide um, Midtown Harrisburg with something they haven't seen at the market before and food they were really gonna enjoy. Um, just like Rob was saying, like we, you know, we're very passionate about food. We don't make anything or sell anything that we don't love. So if a recipe isn't working or we're like, eh, that's just an okay cookie, we don't sell that okay cookie. Um, we sell what we really, really like. And while I still have a love for like corporate um, kitchens because you do have menu development and um, seasonal changing menus, and that's so fun, that's fun as well. I do like that at this point in my life, it really is down to me and Tamisha. Um, and we're very like minded. So um, usually, whatever one likes, the other one does as well. It's it, we don't really butt heads too much on actual ideas. Um, but it's, it pretty much was just, we took a chance and, you know, we had a goal where we wanted to be in five years and we're coming up on that five years. And even with COVID, we think we're going to reach that goal, um, of having, um, our own space. And, but it, it took a lot of hard work. I will say it was more mentally stressful work though, because when you are working corporately or you're, you know, you're working for someone else, that's someone else's money. I mean, really you just get the paycheck, <laughs> um, even though. I always still had my heart invested in it. It still always felt like mine. Um, it is somebody else's business. Sorry, somebody's mowing their lawn. Um, so now it's it's all your own. So if you're if you're failing, if you're not making budget, if you're if your refrigerator breaks, it, it's you. And that is definitely the more stressful part of it. Um, no longer do I have stress of coworkers and people above me. So that's nice, but. Yeah, the stress that, what if the power just goes out in the market? I mean, what are we gonna do? So it's, you know, it's that kind of stress, but it's extremely rewarding. But I think I came about it at the right time in my life. I definitely had a really strong background as did my partner. So um, like I said, that fear of going in and like we already knew labor costs, food costs, we knew all those things and we were strong at it. Um, so that part we weren't worried about. It was just, could we be successful? And we just decided that we were going to be, so. <laughs> So hopefully it's been going well. So. Determination is, is <laughs> yeah. So chef, what drew you to bacon and pastry though specifically? Um, oh, did I just like not answer the question? <laughs> no, you answered my question, but I feel a follow-up great question would be why bacon and pastry to begin with? Yeah. Um, I, I actually was in college and I dropped out my senior year. Um, I was kind of just doing temp work and my sister who still lived in Philadelphia said, come to an open house at a culinary school. You like to bake. And I said, I do. I didn't realize I'd become the family holiday baker. And I will say, I didn't really know. I thought I was going for treats. I sat down and in that half hour, there was a chef Patty there um, selling the school. And I left there and I signed up. 
I, all of a sudden I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And it took me a whole other year to start because of getting money together and moving back to Philadelphia. Um, but I have not had, I mean, there's been some tears in the walk-in. We all have tears in the walk-in, but I've never had a doubt that like when people ask me, is there anything else you'd want to do? There really isn't. I like, I really going in every day and baking is, I mean, that's the easy part. It's, you know, it's fun. I, I'm very lucky in life that I have a job that I truly, truly enjoy. That's awesome. I don't think you've ever told me that story. I wish <laughs> I knew who that Chef Patty was because they they really turned a phenomenal pastry chef out of it. Oh, thank you. You're you're amazing at it, Autumn. I always just say, talk to Chef Patty, talk to Chef Patty. <laughs> that's why everyone comes my way. Yes. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Excellent. Great, great. Thank you. And, and Sheena, how about you? I mean, what drew you to, to be a nutritionist? And I'm sorry to, you know, but I know as the chef world, it's like, there's got to be something that draws you into the nutrition aspect. How did you start? Well, so I'll say in, in the beginning, no, there wasn't. <laughs> um, I When I went to college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I went to Virginia Tech and um, they had a really good nutrition program that I heard about from other people. And I was like, okay, like I'll, I'll give that a go. Um, after college, you have to do a dietetic internship. Um, and during that time, I spent time in clinical nutrition, um, food service, the retail world, a little bit of everything, and ended up with a clinical job after that. Um, I worked over at the Carlisle Hospital um, for a good couple of years um, on the floor, seeing patients and um, also in their weight loss surgery center over there. And I just got to a point um, as a clinical dietitian that I just I felt like I wasn't making as big of an impact as I could. Um, I really like to cook and bake personally at home. And um, so then started exploring Giant a little bit more for my internship ties. And um, then was just kind of able to go that direction and, and have the job that I have now. Um, and it's kind of interesting because a lot of folks that I know that were clinical dietitians now refer their patients to me at Giant because I'm in the grocery store where like I can take a patient or a customer and show them in the aisle like you have diabetes, this is a good product for you to cook with you have, you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, like let's look at what we can put into your menu at home. Um, like I'm right there that I can I can do that with people, whether it be in the store or through the classes that we do now. Um, so I'm just feel like I'm able to to bring to life um, different nutrition recommendations a little bit more by being able to show people things in the store as well as showing them how to cook with those things. I, I think that's extremely important because as that's how I describe you as a nutritionist that loves to cook and is excited about it. You make it fun to, to learn about and to hear about these different um, nutritional facts. I'll just keep putting it that way. <laughs> Uh, that, that's great to hear that you could still bring that, that cooking enjoyment, you know, to your job and again, make it more, it sounds so much more interesting than that clinical, you know, nutrition position that you were talking. So yeah. that's, that's excellent. Great. Awesome. Thank you. And Anna, how about you? What, what got you started into and interested in the, in the cooking world? Uh, I've always cooked. Um, I think I started cooking when I was about seven. I think this was the first time I learned how to make hot dogs and things like that. But I never really realized that was where I wanted to go in life. It's just like I always did it when I started working. Again, McDonald's was my very first job. Um, then I worked at Hardee's and things like that. Um, but it wasn't until I moved to this area and um, I got a job at uh, JDK Catering um, to where like I really realized, you know, you can make this a profession and a career out of it. Um, and I worked there for five years. Um, and when I was there was when I started um, Hack for um, Culinary and Pastry Arts. And um, from there, I, um, I've worked a couple other places. I worked at the Hilton, I worked at Devon's, and um, I still go to back to JDK every once in a while and help them out just because I do love the catering aspect. Um, and how I got into this position. I was working at Hilton as a supervisor and the, the pandemic happened and we got all laid off. 
And I realized that I still wanted to work in this field, but I needed the security of, you know, what if this happened again? Um, so I started looking around and I knew Chef Clark and they were hiring. So I said, I'll give this a try. Um, because we are feeding people on premise, we got to stay opened. Um, so it was all pretty much takeout at the time, but uh, we we're still working, um, benefits and everything. So, uh, that's where I'm at. so I heard because of the pandemic that that you switched gears to that assisted living, and and I think that was really where a lot of the job market was when we were, went in the pandemic. Those that still needed to be fed, it, it wasn't so much you know the restaurants, but you worked in catering. You've worked in a hotel. You've worked in freestanding restaurants that were a franchise of a large corporation. You, so, of all of those, you know, is assisted living a, a spot for you, or do you have sites for you know a certain area maybe as a line cook that that would be a better fit for you? I, I promise. Well, I don't know if Chef Clark is listening, but I'm hoping not. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, for now, this is where I'm going to be. Um, there's a lot of security here at my age. That's kind of what I'm looking for right now. Um, five years down the road, I see myself possibly owning a food truck, actually, um, going that route um, and catering. But uh, yeah, this is a good spot for me right now. We, can, I, we still do events and um, still do from scratch kitchen uh, work and everything. So uh, it's, it's a pretty good fit for me. Excellent. Well, I'm going to lead in the next question that I feel all of you have answered at some point, but if we could just you know, hone it in a little bit for the students, um, what education did you need and experience did you need for the job that you have now? So I know a lot of you have talked about it, but just to bring it right, right to a point here, Anna, to get your position, what education did you have and what experience did you need in order to get that position? Uh, well, a uh, culinary degree for one. Um, I don't know if it's strictly needed, but it is preferred. They do, uh, you do have to do a um, test, like a, a cooking test uh, to get the position. So you need to learn how to do the, the work under uh, pressure and everything that you do learn, like at, at Hack, it's kind of like a final exam. Um, and uh, just, Having previous line experience is helpful, but it's not necessarily needed. Um, like Colin, he didn't really have much experience and he's, he's doing really well in, one, in our other restaurant, so. Um, How about sanitation and safety? Did you need to be certified in order to have your position? Um, you did not need to be certified. Uh, they do have classes available there to uh, take. They offer that uh, to get certified and everything. Okay, but it's not mandated. No, it's not mandated. In the main kitchen, it is. In the okay. uh, in the hospital side, it is. But since this is, we're technically just a restaurant, it's not needed. How about any preference to being ACF certified? I know you have your certified culinarian from the ACF. Was there any uh, preference or any preferred on application regarding your certification? No, I was never asked or anything. Um, I know Chef Clark, uh, before the pandemic and everything, he, the company was paying for him to go to like nationals and to do all that, but it wasn't, it, they don't um, focus on it. Which I hope to try and uh, improve, but you know, I just was curious if there was any, any form of uh, recognition to your, to your certification, because I know that was something you got as you graduated, became a certified culinarian as well, which is excellent. All right, Rob, how about for you? Any education? Uh, I know you talked about the experience and, you know, but how about just for the food truck itself? You said that was several years ago, you opened that. What experience in education did you need in order to start a food truck business? Well, to be honest with you, I'm, I have no formal education other than a high school diploma and serve safe certification. I'm all self-taught. Um, for the food truck, it was just a lot of research. We probably took three years to develop recipes that we liked and uh, figured we could do on a food truck. 
and we experimented with different people and left them try our food and we landed on a pretty simple menu and then we run weekly specials out of the out of the brick and mortar location so we developed a new weekly special i mean i was a, i was able to be creative with hosses so that helped me and it was just a lot of self-learning and reading and researching and talking to chefs uh, hosses actually wanted me to go to culinary school and i talked to a few people and they said you know you already know most of this stuff so just stay focused on your work i mean i wish 40 years ago i would have you know but i am where i am and um, it's mostly self-taught and it's been a fun experience i just i experiment with stuff i mean it's you know there's no oh you have to follow this recipe or you have to do this you kind of create what you want to create. And if it tastes good and people like it, you sell it. Excellent, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna take a big part of that being an educator that he had 40 years of experience, everyone. So education versus 40 years, he already had the 40 years. Um, and I, I draw on the fact that you say you wish you could have gone. So <laughs> excellent, just because I know again, our audience are students, um, but experience definitely um, has a lot to say in, in, in its own. Chef Casey, what um, you mentioned going to culinary school, yeah. uh, but you're a pastry chef. So talk to us a little bit about, about your education experience. Um, so I went to the restaurant school in Philadelphia. Um, you, so I do have an associate's degree in pastry arts, but still you have to take culinary classes as well, um, which are which for fun. Um, so yes, my background's mainly in pastry. Um, my first apprenticeship actually was I had to do like garde manger, like the pantry area in a restaurant in Philly. And they used to always watch to see if I was gonna cut myself because they thought it was funny that like the pastry girl was like chopping things. But anyway, um, I will say personally for me, I'm from a foodie family, but I certainly wasn't the one always cooking in the house. It was my little sister. Um, so I have to say for me, there was no way I would have just hopped in the kitchen. There were a few people in Philadelphia that I worked with who were self-taught. They just hopped into a kitchen one day and said, I'm going to learn up from people. I definitely wasn't that person. I was really, I was so green. It was crazy. So um, culinary school definitely helped me. I was never into school. I was a terrible high school student. I was a terrible college student. I really thrived when I got to culinary school. And I think that's kind of how it just kind of, sunk in that this is definitely something I wanted to do. I had wonderful teachers. Um, it was just a really wonderful year for me there. Um, and then every boss I had, they all brought some not great things, but they also taught me wonderful things. I don't have one boss where I can't say they didn't teach me something really, really important. Um, as far as my job now, having all that experience kind of think does make it a little easier for us to be a little bit more successful right off the bat. But, and I, don't, I hope you don't mind if I kind of jump to this. Well, we do have to be serve safe certified. Tamish and I both do because it's our, it's our business. Um, Lizzie who works for us does not, unless she's being left there alone. But if I hop to this, it's okay. Some people might come up to our stand and see this tiny stand and see the three of us. And we have had people in the past be like, you know, I really like to bake. I can hop back there with you guys. Mm -mm -mm. It is an extremely professional kitchen. You can't tell cause we're acting funny and laughing all the time. Our recipes are detailed. The way we do things are is precise. It's on a schedule and you're not gonna be able to hang unless you have experience or like the, the schooling to back it up, um, to actually know what you need to do as far as safety and sanitation. Um, we don't have time to teach that. And I know that sounds a little crazy because it's just this tiny little place in the Broad Street Market, but we need people who can come in and I show you this recipe and you got it. I, I don't have time to show you five, six times because you're throwing my actual money down the drain. Like my kid can't get shoes because you're throwing the drain. So to us, it's it's important. Now, if you're self-taught, that's fabulous. But that's what I was actually, I was thinking about Rob. I'm like, Rob didn't have no experience. He had a ton of experience. So um, I think school can be wonderful. If it's for you, um, you can school. And we were always taught this as well. It's what you take from it. You know, you can go in there and just pass your tests and just pay attention and kind of go to class. But if you go in, that's what I did. I went in like open-minded and I absorbed like a sponge and it was one of the best things I did. Awesome. So it sounds like, yes, education is important, but experience too. Again, you can't just necessarily 
be educated and jump right into your own business. I'm hearing that experience set you both up really well um, for opening opening up your operations. It's excellent. Um, Shanna, you had mentioned going going to college and having that um, internship. Um, you know, a little bit more into if you could just kind of summarize again um, and any other certifications or credentials that you needed to to get. Yeah. So um, in order to be a registered dietitian. You have to have the education component. You have to have a four-year degree. I have a Bachelor of Science from Virginia Tech um, in human nutrition, foods, and exercise. Um, after that, you have to complete a dietetic internship. The internship isn't what you would typically call like an internship. It was something that I had to pay for. I wasn't getting paid to do it. Um, so it essentially was another year of school um, that I did through Penn State. They have now changed some things with the dietetic internship that it's now a combined master's program. So all dietitians moving forward after 2025 are all required to have their master's as well. Um, so to work at Giant, you do have to be a registered dietitian. So you still need that four years of school. You need your, your um, registration. Um, and in the state of Pennsylvania, you have to have a license as well. So I'm um, also what they call a licensed dietitian nutritionist. So you have to have all those things to do what I do um, at Giant specifically. And with the cooking element, um, did was Giant looking for any sort of culinary background or serve safe certification for you? Um, so not, not a giant. When I did work at the hospital, actually, most dietitians who work at hospitals are under a food service contract. Um, so I did have to be served safe certified there. Um, at giant, um, I feel like they kind of just have this expectation that dietitians know how to cook. Um, so um, it just kind of like fell into place with me there. But I will say that with the position that I have at Giant and the things that I do now, and when I sit in on the hack culinary board sessions, I'm like, could I do that? Like, could I go back? Like, could I take some classes? And like, I'm a single mom. And, but I hear like Chef Patty talk about like people all the time who do it and make it work with whatever type of lifestyle they have, whatever is going on in their life. So like, there's times that I feel like encouraged and motivated to do that. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. But I don't have that right now. <laughs> well, you know where to find me. I know. That's, what I'm That's for it. sure. <laughs> now you're on the radar. Yeah. It, and it's great. I mean, again, I think everyone's tied in. You have to really enjoy what you're doing here. You, you know, and, and I don't think we've really hit on the, the hard parts as much, but you know, you have to enjoy what you're doing. And I love how Chef Casey said, you know, we look kind of wild and crazy because we're having fun, you know, and it should be that way. But I think, you know, you got to go through all the hard work first and you have to, you know, know what you're doing and certainly keep that professionalism. So I'm going to switch things up just a little bit and ask individual questions of, of each of you. Um, Anna, let's go back to you. So if you could just talking a little bit more about the different types of operations there at Messiah Village. So you mentioned there was the uh, building where there's a special diet, um, special special dietary concerns, and then are there multiple restaurants or just the one that you're working at? Yes, uh, there are four restaurants actually. I work, and they're all different. Um, I work at Cafe 100. It's more of a like a bistro type sandwiches, salads. We have some entrees, um, paninis, that kind of thing. Um, and then we have in the same building. Uh, we share a kitchen with um, Catherine's. Catherine's is more fine dining. It's um, filet mignon and all, all like very nice food. <laughs> not that mine's not nice, but uh, very high end food. Um, and then we have Fireside, which is more comfort foods. It's more lasagna, meatloaf, pizzas, that type of food. Um, and then in the main building, they also have uh, Evergreen, which is more of a cafeteria type food, food for like the nurses and uh, doctors over there. Any reason in particular you chose or are working at that restaurant rather than I'm gonna say the more upscale restaurant? Um, I have worked in Catherine's. It's just kind of where it fell when I got hired, that's the position that they needed. Um, I've been trained over in Catherine's and I'll go over there sometimes. 
Um, but for the most part, I can handle the um, cafe by myself. So that's where I am. Any room for advancement for you within that, that operation? Um, yes, there's uh, sous chef positions that I could uh, go up into. There's also Cura is national. So I could become a chef somewhere or general manager or yes, there's uh, plenty of advancement. So with a contract management company that's nationwide, you're saying you could transfer to other accounts within mm -hmm. the, awesome, which is just another, another aspect that maybe you wouldn't think of with the contract management company. Great, thank you. And a question for Rob here next. Um, so students are curious how, with you getting started again, let's think of uh, either the brick and mortar or, or, or the food truck business. What really was involved both with the business legal aspects, but also the financial commitment, not necessarily the dollar amount, but you know, how did you forge kind of your game plan to get started um, dedicating the funds as well as you know, your knowledge and overall game plan? Okay, I, I just wanna mention one thing too. If I knew at 18 that I was gonna end up where I'm at now, I would have went to school. So, and I do have a degree from Hamburger University. So from in Oak Brook, Illinois, from McDonald's. <laughs> um, as far as financing, I took money out of my retirement five years ago to buy the food truck. I just didn't want to borrow money from a bank. And um, I've been thrifty with my money, putting plenty away. Um, so I have a pretty good retirement plan. And I actually took money out again because I was 59 and a half. I, I only had to pay taxes, no penalties. So I financed the brick and mortar without any money from the bank. Um, so I, know, I owe nobody anything at this point. Now, if I move into this other location, I may try and get a small bank loan, but I'm hoping I'm in a position with the money I have in the bank from shredders that I can finance the farmer's market as well. So. I kind of did it all on my own, but the banks are willing to give you money if you can write a good business plan and you can tell them that you make money. And I didn't have any, I didn't have anything to take to the bank with the food truck because we only did it part time. And we were kind of putting the, all the money back in, not really showing a profit at the end of the year because we were, we were working towards getting a new food truck. Yeah. So I've been fortunate to be able to have the money to do it myself, but I know the money's out there, especially now with COVID, there's, there's lots of opportunities to get money if you need to borrow, but I would tell people, try and do as much of it on your own as you can, and then you, you don't really owe anybody anything, and you can do as you please. Excellent advice, definitely. What, what um, licenses did you need? I mean, to just say I'm going to buy a food truck and open it up for business. Did you need to go, if someone wanted to do that, what, what steps did you have take legally to open your, your food truck? Honestly, it's no different than opening a restaurant. I mean, it's just in a smaller, everybody says, oh, well, it's so easy to open a food truck. Well, that's not the case. You have to have the same licenses, the same inspections. You have to pay sales tax. You have to do all the registrations. Opening the brick and mortar was a little harder because I started to have some employees where previously I didn't have any employees with the food truck. Um, the bureaucracy is probably the biggest headache. So many government regulations and different people want this. And I mean, I actually had, when they uh, did the, the final inspection here, the construction company had a mirror in the restroom that was a quarter of an inch too low. They made them take it down and move that mirror up quarter of an inch so there's a lot of bureaucracy and hoops to jump through and um, you know a food truck is a great place to start um, but you have to have a commissary you have to have a place to dump your gray water you have to have a place to dump trash you can have a three bay sink in your truck but if it's not big enough to wash certain dishes the health inspector is going to say where are you washing these dishes I was fortunate uh, Haas has let me use their facility in Hummelstown uh, to store some stuff and to wash some of my bigger dishes. We'd go in there after events and wash all of our stuff in their dish room. Um, 
I dumped my trash there. I got ice there. You have to have potable water. You can't just draw water from your home. I could cook on the food truck at my home, but I couldn't cook any food inside the house, nor could I wash any dishes inside the house. In some states you can, Pennsylvania you cannot. So I had a well, so I had to fill up with potable water from hosses because or I would have had to have my well inspected and pass all of these. So there's, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, but you kind of learn as you go and figure stuff out. I think the key point is you did jump through all the hoops. You were successful. Here you are. So <clears throat> in case anyone's discouraged here, and there's a good bit to getting your own um, anything started, I think with any successes in life, it's, it's going to take a few steps. So thank you for, for sharing. Certainly, I know there's there's a lot involved. How about for you, Chef Casey, and starting, you, now you're at the Broad Street Market. Uh, what was involved with you starting your business, you know, with the financial aspect as well as those legal aspects for you? We took a small loan and it was really small. Like it was one of those, we can walk away and this won't, buy, <laughs> won't be a problem loan. Um, it was just so we can afford um, our build out, like our stand and our major equipment. So the mixer, the refrigerator, the freezer, those expensive items. Um, the floor had to be ripped up. Tamisha and I ripped the floor up ourselves. We were like, two thousand dollars, we'll just do it ourselves. That was fun. Um, so we did a lot of a lot of things hands on, decorative wise, anything we could do on our own. Um, I will say one of the things Tamisha got involved with really um, early is looking through. I and I forget if it's through the city. I think it's through the state. Um, there are mentorship programs um, for people who want to open small businesses with the state. Um, and they can kind of, and obviously just going online, there's, it's a lot, not easier now, but can imagine like pre, like Google, how you went about all this, but you know, there's actually checklists exactly what you need. And again, like different, because we're in this, we're in the city versus um, out more in the suburbs. But even now um, we had to inspection wise to open, we just had to be inspected by the food inspector. Now the new thing coming from the city is, as we go to open another space, you have to now be, have your, I think it's the electric, um, but your plumbing has to be inspected by the city as well. So instead of just getting your food person to come in like they do twice a year anyway, now you have to get your plumbing and your electric done as well. So those are expenses, those things take time. I mean, say you're thinking of opening in July, well, you better start making those appointments now because who knows if they, when they're gonna come in and inspect you. So that could even push you Back. So you think you're opening in July, but the guy's like, I can't check your plumbing till the second week of July. So you can't open. So those things are things you don't ever really think about because when you're corporate, you don't have to worry about it. Um, just getting the right licensing, like the mercantile license from the city, um, getting your EIN number, your employee um, uh, identification number set up so you can pay your taxes. Um, one of the best things we did, and we didn't do it till we had an employee, is we got an accountant and um, they're wonderful. <laughs> and now we pay ourselves. <laughs> but um, when we got them, it, it was great because prior to that, you know, come tax season, Tamisha and I always owe taxes. And so, you know, we pay that little bit for the accountant, but in the end, we're getting more money back ourselves. Um, things are definitely a lot more on the up and up. We're not panicking come tax season that we don't know what we're doing and then paying somebody a lot of money to do our taxes. Um, so a lot of people will say that you need a lawyer right up front. We didn't use a lawyer. We used LegalZoom to um, register our, um, our, our business name, Raising the Bar. Um, we just paid a one-time fee with them. I know some people have a lawyer right away. Um, I think going forward, we're gonna need a lawyer. Um, but definitely the accountant was helpful. But yeah, if you're willing to do the work and Tamisha, I said, um, her part in this partnership is she's great with paperwork with stuff like this she'll dig down and she'll find everything. So <laughs> um, she's found any grant in this past year, any, any free money, she's been sending out word all, all year. So um, it's, yeah, that, that's when I was talking about earlier about um, some of the mental stress. It, it's more of that. Like I, she told me the other day, she was, we have to get our plumbing inspected. I'm like, why do we have to get plumbing inspected? She's like, it's a new thing. And I'm like, yeah. And like, how do you even find that out? I'm like, I mean, it's not how she found out, but you know, we probably would have found out as we went and started building our new place. And then it's just one more fee, one more person to contact. So that's the parts where I find it stressful. And you know, you're mentioning several different things. Anything with um, insurance? Did you have to have like insurance or? Yeah, um, so insurance, yeah. 
Um, I just, I did what I thought was right at the time. And I went to the person who I do my car and my house insurance through. And I said, Sharon, can you help me? And she actually walked me through everything. And it, it's actually, a, and you know what? And I've heard of businesses that don't have it. And we pay so very little for so much coverage. Um, I, like I make jokes about it, like, you know, like the fire, <laughs> like it, we, it, it's, it's so worth it. That little bit we pay twice a year um, covers so much, like literally covers this entire business um, if anything would happen. So yeah, that was right off the bat for us as well. And now the, the market does, um, they do need proof of insurance to run a, uh, to run a business. You know, they have a historic building. It's been open, I think 150 years continuously. They don't want somebody burning down their building. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I just threw that part in there because I think we talk a lot of times about the licensing the structure. I know the Small Business Association, yes, has tons of mentorship uh, programs available in all different areas throughout Pennsylvania. Uh, but it's important to also realize that that insurance liability as well that uh, that we need to have coverage for. So awesome. Uh, I want to shift gears slightly and move to the purchasing topic. This is something that students are really interested in. And, and I'll, I'll switch to you here, Shana, for a little bit. Um, you work in a grocery store. So you plan a class, you decide what you're making. What interaction, I mean, how do you go about uh, buying your food products for, for your daily tasks? Yeah, um, so obviously I buy them all at Giant. <laughs> um, but um, the biggest thing that for me, like and with what I do in my classes, knowing that people are going to be making these recipes at home is that we try to do everything on a budget. Um, so like for those family meals classes that I talked about or the baking classes, like you're not going to see me using something very off the wall, very expensive. Like right now, our goal is to really meet people where they are with, like I said, on a budget and making these meals friendly to that. Um, so when I shop for my classes, I shop just as I would for like making a, a meal for myself and my daughter, like keeping costs in mind and what would work for us and what would work for others. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's my main goal when I'm shopping. Now, and are you doing it in bulk or just for each individual class because you're right there, purchase it, teach the class and then yeah, honestly, I do mine more individual class basis rather than buying anything in bulk. Um, it's since I'm right there, like you said, I, I do pretty much class by class. And you mentioned about taking, um, you know, customers through the grocery store, like with a diabetic diet and showing them different products. Um, is that something that, you know, you have specifically labeled, you know, aisles now that these are for, you know, here are diabetic products, or is that something, how do you go about educating um, those, those customers on, on those specific products that they can absorb it all in 20 minutes, you know, and, and, and walk away with it? It's hard. Um, so there are certain sections of the store, like there is a small section of the store that has a lot of like sugar-free products, like syrups and jellies and things of that nature. Uh, we do have a gluten-free section. So for folks who are just sensitive to gluten um, or have celiac disease, we have parts like that in the store. But at Giant, we also really pride ourselves in those products being throughout the whole store. So whenever I have folks um, with me, I, I tend to shop the whole store. You know, we go around the perimeter, we go up and down every aisle. Um, it is a lot to absorb all at one time. Sometimes these sessions have to be broken down, um, you know, into two, two trips or, or whatnot. Um, it is a lot to cover, but yeah, it is pretty much the whole store that I try to go over. Which is excellent, you know, to, to know that there's products available all over, not just necessarily this, this small little, only go down this aisle if you need these ingredients. Great, right. um, thank you. Anna, let's go back to you. What, how are you involved with purchasing? Um, in your position, go ahead. Um, in our, my position, it more falls on um, whatever product or um, if I take a product that I see as um, lots of it, say um, watermelon or something, I'm making a fruit salad. Um, I will write it. We have a whiteboard that will write what we need on um, or I'll just tell them, hey, we need this. Uh, we get our stuff from multiple locations. Um, we do Cisco, we do uh, Kegels, 
um, John Gross, but we also go to Costco a lot because it just seems to be cheapest there. A lot of the meat products and stuff we'll just get from uh, Costco. Um, and we'll do our uh, giant run because we're a giant run down the street. Um, but we do uh, different soups every day and things. So uh, to be prepared, we'll have to tell them, hey, um, I need 10 pounds of ground beef for this. Uh, can you get it in for tomorrow or whatever? Uh, so. When you say you tell them, who is the them? Um, the chef or sous chef. Okay. So that is the, I guess that's what I'm getting at. Who does the purchasing? Who is responsible for the purchasing in, in your operations? The sous chef? It's chef. it's usually uh, both the sous chef and the chef. Okay. Working so so your, your role is filtering the needs to them and then they're yes. doing. So, so in your role, you're not actually placing the purchase orders and receiving yeah. the products, which again, can vary to, to many different operations, how involved you are. Um, but there you have the chefs doing it. Okay. And, and getting from, from multiple locations. And it's surprising to hear um, Costco and, and, you know, some other, but they, they, they're value spots that are definitely out there. So I get that. Excellent. Good. How about Rob, for you, what kind of, per, how, you mentioned you have the brick and border. So you're making, you have a kitchen to work out of, but generally how do you purchase your products on a weekly basis? Where do you get them from? How are you storing them? Uh, most of my stuff comes from the restaurant depot currently. That's what I used when I had the truck because I had limited space for storage. Um, so currently I probably go to the restaurant depot twice a week, but I'm working on setting up with Cisco or uh, any of the other multiple companies out there. I'm just trying to find someone who will deliver here. And I sent them my inventory needs and I'm waiting to hear back. So in, I'm hoping I'll get to the point where I can have someone deliver but if I find really good deals at the depot on pork is a big thing that we sell a lot of pork, but, um, but even there right now, I mean, there's so many crazy things going on in the world. Like you're limited to buy, I can go buy, we use chicken. I use chicken breasts and chicken thighs to create our chicken shredded chicken. And I can only get two cases of chicken thighs every time I go there. So if I need eight cases, I have to go four days in a row to get my eight cases of chicken thighs. So I don't know why there's a shortage on chicken thighs, but <laughs> it's just a crazy world right now. So it seems to be catching. I feel there's a shortage on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So anyone not familiar, the restaurant depot is kind of the Costco for, for the commercial industry. You do need to have an account to go there, but um, it, they do definitely have some great pricing and the idea that you get to walk through it and select, which I think is is is, is often important there as well. Even even if you don't buy anything there, it is it's fun to just see it. <laughs> it is, and dress warmly for the you know half of it that is is refrigerated, yep. certainly cold. <laughs> Great. How about you, Chef Casey? Where you mentioned Tuesday was your purchasing day, um, and then you're going hard the rest of the week. So you said limited storage. You can't get the big food deliveries. How do you handle your purchasing? So yeah, we have to be really careful about what we bring in. Um, the biggest thing is meaning dairy. So eggs and butter, we go through a lot of butter. Um, so it's kind of hard, you know, if we run out of milk, we are at a market, um, but you know, sometimes the prices at the market, you know, when it's, um, I don't even know, like organic milk, you know, that you just need to put in something that's supposed to be cheap. You have to be really careful what you're purchasing. Um, but yeah, I go on Tuesdays, um, just like back when I was, well, any place else I've ever worked, same thing with Anna, you have a whiteboard, you're writing down when something's low, not when it's out, when it's low. Um, I've made many mistakes where I have to run out to Target or Giant real quick. I've made major mistakes where I have to run out in the middle of the day. <laughs> so um, right now, for the most part, because our, our menu doesn't change a ton, you know, it's all the basic stuff every week. Um, but if we decide to run a special, if we want something different, but for the most part, if we have something we want to do locally, we can source it out of the market. So any kind of fruits or vegetables, stuff like that, we can do out of the market. But it's, I mean, I've been doing, I mean, it was like 15 years at Brico having to do the purchase order online with Cisco. So doing this isn't too bad. It's only if we just miss that obscure item that you don't use very often. I will say Costco is the cheapest price on almond flour that we have found. So <laughs> I have to send my mom to Costco for me. <laughs> um, 
But for the most part, yeah, we use the Restaurant Depot because it's it's the best thing available to us at this point because we can't afford a Cisco delivery. But yeah, we have to be very careful. We get down usually by the end of production, we have about two to four pounds of butter left. So if we screwed up a chocolate chip cookie dough two days prior, we might not have enough butter to finish our croissants for the weekend. So it's really important that we're, we're tight with everything. We make it work. So not having very much storage, I'm thinking, I'm envisioning like, you know, 200 pounds of butter you bring in on Wednesday because you only make like 600 croissants over the weekend, right? Something like that. Oh, no, it's like, no, not that many. I wish if we made that many, I'd be relaxing. <laughs> and I thought I was on point with that. No, no. So you you come back with all these products. You only have a small upright cooler. Yeah, like the bottom of the, like we have the double refrigerator. The bottom is just eggs and butter. And that's all it is. Um, so a lot of times people are just like, you need to make more food. You know, we start selling out on Saturdays. Um, you need to make more food. You need to make more food. Well, we have to mix our bread the day before and the dough has to sit in the refrigerator. We physically can't put any more product in unless we bought another refrigerator and there's no space for another refrigerator. So we really, I think if somebody came in, like people who are already in the industry came in and opened our fridges on a Friday night, they'd be like, wow, how do you do this? Like, this is impressive. We call it Tetris, the Friday Tetris you know, getting everything. We literally have bread doughs balancing on things. Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, we have, so that's why like sometimes we don't, we'll reuse things. So like our kolaches might have cheesecake batter and strawberry jam in it. Then another dessert's gonna have strawberry jam in it too. I can only put so many jams in the fridge. So we have to kind of play around like that, make it work, make it happen. <laughs> yeah, well, cross utilization. I yeah. feel a lot of students have learned That's from. the better word for it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right, great. So um, I have two more kind of pre pre put up questions, just as a reminder and check on time, about seven minutes after seven. So again, if anyone has any questions to add into the chat, please feel free. I have no problem continuing asking questions the entire time, but we would like to have your questions if anyone does have some. All right, moving on, the next subject was really how the pandemic changed what you do. And I think uh, you've all touched on this in some aspect um, overall with, you know, changing the direction of your career, making different adaptations. And I think that's what we're looking for specifically, not so much um, how your career changed, but maybe what are some things that changed in the last year within your position based on the COVID pandemic? And what things do you think will continue to be here? Um, I'm going to say when we're out of it. I'm going to make that plunge when we're out of it. So uh, I'm sorry, Anna, let's go ahead and start with you. What have you noticed over the last year other than wearing masks? Um, well, where I work, uh, one thing that changed drastically, I, I wasn't there when it, we didn't do it this way. So I've just heard about it is uh, now we get a lot of pre-orders before it was a lot of walk-ins. Um, people just come in when they're hungry and get food. Now, uh, because of the pandemic, when we closed our doors, it was all pre-orders. They all had to call by a certain time to be delivered at, we have like two delivery times in the evenings, uh, four or 5.30. Um, so now people still do that, which is great. I love it because now you know how much uh, we can prep ahead of time, uh, how much food we have to pull from the freezer, any proteins or anything. Um, and it just, uh, since I'm the only line cook, I do it all. I do all the sauces, all the, the meats. I make all the sandwiches, salads, and everything. It's nice to have the stuff, all my ducks in a row. Um, so that's something that's changed a lot. Um, also, uh, Catherine's, the fine dining restaurant, they don't do walk-ins right now. It's all, you got to call in and make reservations or uh, pre-order your meals by like three o'clock. So they open at four, they know pretty much what they're gonna do for the, the whole night. Um, if it's a big party, they have to pre-order, um, things like that. That's uh, the most things. And uh, it seems like because it's, even though we're open to the public, most of our uh, clientele are the people that live on pre premise and uh, they're older and they're pretty much set in their ways. So they now will continue to pre-order. They are happy with that, so. It sounds like that made it more efficient on your end with, you know, again, yes, in sales, it was a lot easier. You didn't just have to do that. You knew exactly what they were ordering as well. So yeah. and a lot of them order the same thing every single day or um, you get to know them. So, you know, 
You're saying, oh, you know, they got the omelet yesterday, so they're going to get the Belgian waffle today. So, all right, great, great. Uh, Rob, how about for you? What what has changed in the last year, and what do you think will will stick around here after COVID? Well, for me, um, working in the food truck is horrible. Wearing a mask, it's hot, it's unbearable. I carry a couple masks in the truck and extra shirts. Um, when we opened the brick and mortar, we focused mainly on carry out. We have online ordering, we have call in ordering, we have people walk in as well. We only have two tables, uh, so we kind of force everybody to take it with. There's a few people who dine in, but we've really focused on that. I think at some point I may get into the delivery, but the fees are ridiculous. And unless you, you know, then that's a whole nother hoop to jump through. If you del do delivery on your own, there's insurance and cars and background checks. And so it's just, but I think delivery carry out all of that is probably here to stay. I mean, it just seems like people like to order online, have it already paid, just come in and pick it up and they're done. And the other side of that is the credit card, you know, if you're with, I'm with Square, you know, if somebody comes in and swipes their card, they charge this fee. But if somebody orders online and they have to manually, they charge twice as much on the fee. So you have to think about all that stuff when you're pricing and doing all, all those kind of things. So um, I, I don't know. I hope the masks go away soon. <laughs> you know, uh, we'll, I think people will probably wear them in the winter. When cold and flu season's around, I think people will probably still wear them. I know one person who will not, you know, but like I said, working in the truck is, is crazy with a mask on. So prior to COVID, did you have any pre-ordering system or that was developed because of the need, right? Yeah, we, um, if we do like a high school, you know, we'll go in, I was just at Dolphin County Votech today, the teachers, they have a food truck every Wednesday, the teachers come out, they get their stuff. I set up pre-ordering with some places like that so they can pre-order, give us a time, pay, and, and then come and pick it up. Um, well, most, most of the time we have them pay when they pick it up for, for the food truck because I don't have the sophisticated square on the food truck. But, um, yeah, so the pre-ordering, you know, I think people will like that. Even, even running the food truck, you know, this past summer during COVID, you had to put cones out so people were six feet apart and... But food trucks thrived during this. And I, I think people found that they like food trucks coming into their neighborhood. You go in for a two hour shot, hit a neighborhood, everybody comes out. Some they have little block parties and they social distance and they sit around in the park and eat and talk and get together. I think those things are probably here to stay for a while. Excellent. Yes, our, our student representative that again can inform the questions here. Um, she shared with our membership that in her neighborhood, she had every Wednesday night for, I think it was three or four months straight, a different food truck that, and it was just the excitement for, for that entire neighborhood. And I, I think, you know, the food trucks bring that excitement on, on its own. You know, here's, here's food coming to us and available in a, in a you know, a nice variety to choose from. Sure. Um, Shana, anything that changed for you other in, co well, a lot had changed for you in COVID, certainly. Um, any highlights you want to share with us? Um, not in particular. Like I said, it was mainly just our transition to doing everything online. Um, and we were very unsure as to how that was going to go, like if people would even be interested in it. Um, and we started off with those classes only having about five to 10 people. And now we're having upwards of 80 to 100. Um, and it's just kind of amazing how much People do really want to try to learn how to cook at home and and have that type of, of thing going on for them. So it's been very successful when we were really unsure about it, but people seem to still be really interested in about it. We're not sure how, like if that's going to continue when things do start to open up more, if people are still going to be interested. So we'll see how that goes, but yeah. I think you have a lot of credibility with the idea that you're cooking in a healthy aspect, but yet you're relatable to a lot of individuals. You know, sometimes in a chef perspective and here's what I'm making, yeah, that's a little too fancy for me. Like Chef Casey just blew through that croissant. What, what did you just make? You know, and I think you you bring that that relatability to it. And again, the 
idea that what you're showing them to make is a healthier option. I think a lot of times that's attracting people as well. Uh, you know, come into a class versus being able to catch it online. Uh, do you feel on your end, as long as there is a demand for it, that, that those online classes will continue or more so in person? Um, it sounds like we're probably going to end up doing a hybrid of, of both. Um, but we, like I said a little while ago, we feel like we are reaching so many more people by doing them online, which we couldn't do in store. So I kind of feel like like it's going to stay, stay both. And and I do some of these classes at the cooking school in Camp Hill, but I do a lot of them at home. Um, so I think that that's kind of another thing that people like about it because my classes are so regular and I have so many regulars, like people have kind of become a part of my home, like in, in my family. And they, I mean, you guys see Verity right now, like everybody, all these hundred people in my classes know Verity and, and everything like that. So um, I, I think it's just kind of created like a sense of family that we didn't necessarily have in the store, um, which has been really neat. Yeah, excellent. I, you know, I'm really trying to pull some of the positives that, that we've, you know, explored over the last year and what we can continue with um, and certainly, you know, go back to also. Chef Casey, what you mentioned takeout, you know, obviously, you know, you had to shift to takeout and, and ordering. So talk a little bit about what you were impacted by and what things you think are going to going to stay after. Um, like everyone, I'm sure that first month was startling and we weren't equipped to do deliveries at all. Um, which it was just me and Lizzie doing <laughs> deliveries. So we were kind of going all over um, where normally we never leave the building. Um, so again, that was just really stressful. And of course that the numbers aren't there, um, but Tamisha Im immediately went to using an online store um, through Square, um, where before you either ordered right in front of us or you shot us a message on social media, um, which didn't happen a lot. People usually just came into the market. So it took a while for people to kind of grasp that we had the menu up every week, what time it went up, what time you stopped orders. Um, Cause you know, a lot of people just think, you know, we're not the Olive Garden. You can't order 20 croissants at midnight and get them the next day at 8 a.m. It doesn't work that way. So um, it took a while for people to catch on to that. Um, and we kind of just stopped the store um, around Christmas. We were able to like transition out of it. Enough people were coming back into the market, but people have gotten really used to now messaging us um, because we don't have a website. So they've, they've gotten more comfortable messaging us. They look forward to seeing the menus. So I, I wouldn't necessarily use the word that we thrived, but we weren't hurt as much, I think, as some places were. Um, and I think a lot of that is, and we do try to stay positive about it. I think a lot of it is kind of like the food trucks going into neighborhoods, although we couldn't be near each other and we were all distancing and all that. I think it did bring a more of a sense of community, though, in the small areas we do live, which is nice. Um, people really came out and supported local and small businesses. People we didn't even know were like great customers of the market. We're getting people to order kids from people from my kids school. I didn't even know them. I, they're not in my kids grade. They're like, we know you're a business owner with the school. So they bought like a bag of goodies for like, that were like $50, but like for five different friends, you know, and, and did stuff like that. So I, what I do like to think is that maybe like neighborhoods and developments are getting together more as a community where before everybody was just busy running out to soccer games and doing all that. So, but the online store without that square online store, we would have been a mess. There'd be no way for us to get orders in. So Tamisha hopping on that right away saved us, I think. And do you think that'll stay? Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's really nice, especially at the holidays. Um, hopefully, once we open a new space, we'll have a website and everything. But um, yeah, the, the stores, it's pretty simple to use. Um, it's easy for her to change it up every week. Um, you plug it in there, like, this is how many croissants we have to sell. So when they're out, they're out. You know, we don't have to monitor it to make sure, ooh, it's getting out of hand. It's just like, hey, how many cake orders do you want to take this week? And we just plug that number in, so it's nice. I've seen many times where you've posted all sold out, you know, and, and I'm thinking, all right. He's going home. <laughs> it all and hand it all out, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's awesome. Awesome. All right. I have another question here, which uh, may take us to the end again. As if anyone does have questions, make sure you're funneling them in. I've been kind of, you know, interjecting throughout. So it seems like every student wants to know if you had you know, the opportunity, what would be your, your largest piece of advice to give those students that is looking to go into your field? So Chef Casey, while we have you, someone that's looking to open a bakery, what would be your best piece of advice for them? 
Um, just to your research about where you like, you know, in my case, it had to be in this area. This is where I am. It's where my family is. Tamisha lives downtown. We knew we wanted to focus in Midtown. Get to know your neighborhood. Who's in there? Um, is the food style you're going to do going to work? Um, is there a place a block away? <laughs> um, so yeah, those basics of get to know who you're planning on selling to and how you're going to reach those people. Um, check everything out, what, what you're willing to do and what you're willing to put into it. I'd even say this just with the job over the years in teaching and even just having people come in as interns and, and meeting workers over the years is people really still think, I don't know why baking is like, I wake up and I decide when I'm gonna bake that day. Like I'm in the mood for cupcakes. Um, so it's, it's very frustrating that people don't understand that like when by the time you're 30 you have back problems, <laughs> <laughs> and your knees hurt all the time, um, that it's long hours on your feet constantly. And especially if you're going to have the business, I'm sure Rob can back me up on this. The mind never shuts off. So even when you have the Sunday off, you'll see something that reminds you of something and you're laying in bed thinking pork <laughs> and you can't get out of your head. So I would just research what's in your area. Is it going to fit what you want to do? Tamisha and I knew with our list of items we want to do, there wasn't a lot of scratch, scratch bakeries right downtown. Um, we do everything from scratch um, and no one made croissants from scratch that we were aware of. So that was one of the things we wanted to hop on. At the time, there wasn't a lot of people doing fresh bread other than the place we were leaving. <laughs> we're making fresh bread on a daily basis. So all our items, when you come in, anything that's made from dough based is made that day. It's baked that day. We don't sell day old product. So that's where we kind of reached out. We figured with the market, and the people who were living in Midtown at the time, those were the kind of people who would want that sort of thing. Awesome, so knowing who your target market is and what they want before they even know it, so you give it to them. Let me, I'm gonna sidebar this real quick. Have you ever thought about a CSA? Oh, you know, it, it's funny. You turn wrong, it might be more slang, but like a bakery CSA. Well, so Tamisha kind of came up with that at the beginning of it, we did, um, the, uh, like a bread bag. I forget what we called it. Was it a bread box? But you ordered it and it was that week's, I forget it was 15 or $20, but it was like two different breads, a treat, and then something to go along with the bread. So like if it was Italian themed, we do it like a jar of bruschetta to like, like the tomatoes and the mozzarella to go along with um, your focaccia, which went along with an Italian dessert. And people, it took a while, but people still ask about it. They're like, when you bring back the, oh, it was the bread program. When you bring back the bread program? But it was exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> every week to come up with another theme and, and and execute it and not spend a ton of money. And, but the people who liked it really liked it. So yes, Chef Patty, that's a good idea. <laughs> I was just curious, just curious, just curious. Cause it just seems as though, you know, that in any event, <laughs> there, but excellent. So again, knowing who your target market is. And, and I think I preach that just about in every single class, know who your audience is and deliver what they want, not just what is your favorite. You know, and I think that's that's crucial. Definitely. Thank you. And uh, best piece of advice to a student that was in your shoes not that long ago, wanting to go into a line cook chef position, what would be the best piece of advice you'd give them? Look around, search. Uh, there are so many different avenues you can go into, whether it's catering or just regular line cook or being in a facility, uh, facility or something like that. There's so many different one place you just might not, might, you may hate and you think, oh my God, I can't do this. I'm just going to get out of the business totally. And then you, and you know, try another place and it just, you click there. Um, there's just so many different, I mean, you might not like working with fish, but you might find out that you like working in a fine dining or something like that. I don't know. It's just, it's, there's just so many different ways to go and, try them all <laughs> so explore the different different avenues and make sure and i know what we heard about earlier was find something you're passionate about and and mm -hmm. something you enjoy doing so really explore and, and i think that's what's great about a lot of these educational programs is they they have you dabble in a lot of different areas and and, and get experience in those areas so that you can pick a path um and again i know you've worked in several different ones so I, I think you you pretty much hit home that you were looking for more than just the actual task, though. You were also looking for the benefits and the whole package that went with it. Not yeah, the security and everything. Also, network, like ACF, 
go start going to meetings and meet people. When I got laid off at the Hilton and I was looking for another avenue, it was because I knew Chef Clark from the ACF. I also worked with him at the casino, but I wasn't like directly working with him. So it was more through the ACF that I knew him um, and was able to make the connection. Excellent. Yes. And so the networking and getting to know those in your community and, and certainly the idea that you're looking for, I don't know, to learn about a bakery. Maybe you go to Raisin the Barn, you know, get a slight internship to dabble in there. Or, you know, again with Rob, what if we want to look into a food truck? What, Rob, what would be your best piece of advice to give students looking to, to open up a, their own restaurant, their own food truck? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to just say to Chef Casey, I love our CSA. And if maybe you could connect with one that's already established, because I would love to get a loaf of bread yeah. in my CSA <laughs> every week. I never just thought one about bread. that. Yeah. One bread in there. Just one. Just throw one yeah. in there. Yeah, that would be awesome. Oh, you'll have to let me know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I never think of us being a part of somebody else's thing. I don't know why. Like, I struggle with that sometimes. Like, I struggle with doing, uh, why am I lacking for the word? Coming together. Doing something with somebody else. Yeah. Collaboration. That's the but word. Then, I mean, I, I would love, I'm with Straits right now. I used to, oh, okay. do, I used to be with Spiral Path Farms. Mm -hmm. But Straits is supposed to be getting into more some more organics. But yeah, I mean, it'd be cool to get a loaf of bread. Oh, that's pretty neat. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Good idea. Um, Okay, well, for me, I just wrote down a couple things. I think you you have to be passionate. You have to love what you're doing. You have to be willing to live it. Don't let anyone tell you you can't. The worst thing that can happen is you can fail, but you still tried and you just pick yourself up and you maybe it pushes you in a different avenue. It was like me losing my job with COVID. Maybe I was supposed to be doing this, you know, maybe... I started the food truck five years ago part time because COVID was coming. I think there's somebody out there who pushes you in the right direction and set yourself up to be able to give back somehow, whether it's stuff like this or, you know, I try, I'm trying to give free meals away at the food bank on occasion when I can. Um, so put yourself in a position to give back. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, at least you tried. Jeff, that is awesome to hear. A uh, real quick personal story. My, my daughter is in kindergarten. And this morning she had to write why she wanted to be a chef. I know that surprises everyone, but why does she want to be a chef? Because they get to make a bunch of money and help out people in need is what she wrote. I almost wanted to say, wait a sec, maybe not the first part, but the <laughs> part was so warming. And, and just from what she said, you know, the idea of giving back whether it be handing out free meals, whether it be, you know, providing or giving your time, um, whether it be mentoring others, you know, joining the panel and educating others about it. I think that that really hit it on, on the nose. And I think even just having a, a six-year-old realize the importance of that. I think, you know, that's, that's a great message to share. Thank you. Certainly. Shana, any, any advice you have for students that are looking to get into this dietitian field, you know, anything you can share with them? Um, I would say, I mean, I talked about the, the schooling part a lot, um, it's essentially six years, it's going to be seven now in the future. Um, and I would just say like, there's always like the light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to school, there were so many classes that I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, you know, things of that nature. Um, but at the end of the day, like getting that paper and whatnot was, was worth it. So that way I can do what I, I do now. And kind of what you just mentioned that your daughter said, like, I feel like I've, especially in the position I'm in now, I can finally help people, um, you know, bringing food to life in their kitchen. And I wouldn't have been able to do that had I not continued to go through the schooling that I did to get here. So just to keep pushing through, even when you don't want to. <laughs> That's excellent. You, you all brought up such, such great points. I, I really do appreciate it. Hope I know we've come to the 7.30 mark, but I, I know we recorded this, we can review it. Um, again, I really appreciate all of your time. I think all of the responses were great to give students a really good look into these positions. 
realistic positions that after graduating, they can go and do themselves. Maybe some of them are thinking, now I need a whole lot of experience before I jump in, or let me go work under this person, or let me, you know, shift gears into schooling, or again, you know, what kind of experience, but you all brought so much to the table, and I, I very much thank you for that. Hope, you want to close this out? Well, I want to thank you, Chef Patty. My goodness, the questions that you put and the work that you, you know, working with the student at your school, I think it just, it was invaluable um, um, insight for us to be able to present. Um, I don't see that we have any questions, but I think it's because you covered everything and you really hit all the mark. And thank you everybody for joining us today. I mean, I can't wait to go down to the market. I'm like, what are the hours? And then I'm like, where's shutters? I'm like looking around, I'm like, I have to get back out there to do stuff. So um, yes, we did record this. I am going to put it together. Um, I'll send out the YouTube link for us to share. Um, I know that the instructors will love this. And it, you know, honestly, every all the comments I'm seeing in the chat is thank you. This was so interesting. This was wonderful. Wait. Yes, the questions, the answers were on point. Yes, there we go. <laughs> so I think that they're seeing that you know you really covered everything, Chef Patty. So um, with that said, we are at 7:30. I, I appreciate everybody's time. I hope everybody has a good dinner tonight and has a great rest of the uh, week and weekend. Thanks, so. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Chef Patty. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>